Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining another new anesthesia round at Western University. Today, we're going to talk about chronic intracranial stenosis, specifically Moya Moya disease, and some of the anesthetic considerations. The learning objectives of today will be to describe the pathophysiology of Moya Moya disease, describe its presentation, go through the management options, mainly the, the surgical techniques, and review the importance of having a detailed anesthetic plan to manage these patients. The definition of Moya Moya disease will be an isolated chronic cerebrovascular occlusive disease with an unknown etiology, which usually will be bilateral. However, it could also present unilateral. And it will be a gradual narrowing of the terminal ICA and the circle of Willis. As a consequence, there will be a fragile network of collateral vessels at the base of, this, of the brain. It's important to note the difference between the Moya Moya disease and the Moya Moya syndrome or quasi MMD, which basically is the same phenomenon in the background of a neurological or extra neurological disease. Mainly related, sickle cell disease, neurofibromatosis 1 or trisomy 21. This table presents a whole bunch of other medical disorders which are associated with Moya Moya disease. Moya Moya comes from the Japanese for puff of smoke, and it's as a consequence of that fragile network of vessels that grow in the brain as a consequence of the chronic ischemia. The epidemiology it's mainly related uh, to East Asian descendants. Uh, however, it will present in a wide different background. Um, the top three countries where it is, has been ported is Japan, Korea, and, Ch and China. It will usually have a female predominance two to one where that changes uh, over different places. And over time, the prevalence has increased mainly because proving the accuracy of radiological techniques because of genetic counseling and the increase in survivors. The exact mechanism why MMD is more susceptible to Asians is unclear. This graph represents the distribution in the world, the prevalence of MMD, and so you can see the East Asia and Japan is where you'll find most of the patients. However, also in Africa and North America, there, there will be some of them. This will summarize and present how uh, the prevalent trends are in, in some of the countries, Korea, Japan, China, and certainly letter E will demonstrate uh, the familial MLD. We know that around 10 to 15% of MLD has a familial inheritance. However, that will be more prevalent in Japan and not as well in other countries in which the theology probably is more systemic or environmental. To explain the theology is quite complex. However, I decided to break it in three angiogenesis, genetic factors, and immune and inflammation mediators. When we talk about angiogenesis, we'll talk about mainly an aberrant type of angiogenesis. And it was the overexpression of endothelial progenital cells, EPCs, vascular endothelial growth factors, and hepatocyte growth factor, which usually will support the structure of the vessels. So this type of cells will have mutations and, and you know, abnormal expression of the mitochondria, and that will cause um, the overexpression and the prone function of them. Uh, there are also genetic factors. Uh, this 
disease MMD is mainly polygenetic and it has its low C heterogeneity. We know that the RNF213 and non-RNF213 is mainly related uh, to the ischemic and non-ischemic presentation of MMD and also the MMFP3. And lastly, immune and inflammation mediators, we know that there is an infiltration mainly an intima of T cells and macrophages in the expression of IgG and IgM on the pathology. To make that a little bit more clear, uh, I brought this out and, and you can see how everything begins uh, with variants of the RNA-213 other genetic factors. However, at the same time, environmental factors and out of doing any inflammation will have something to do with that brain genesis. The overexpression of microRNAs, the overexpression of dysfunctional endothelial uh, cells or co-information cells, and interestingly, the KVL1. If you remember, the KVLI are scaffold proteins that appear in the invagination of endothelial cells, and they intervene in the production genesis of vessels. So the, the down relation of them will also contribute to a variant angiogenesis. All that together uh, will get into that vascular stenosis and a variant angiogenesis. This image, uh, it's a patient or is a patient's ICA with staining in the moonlight to clinical staining. And you can see how there is the infiltration and response of IGS. So in the, in the pathology, we mainly see two prominent changes. First of all, fibrocellular thickening of the intimal layer and destruction and proliferation of this muscle muscle and the tunica media, which will mainly produce that occlusion of the vessels. The clinical findings are quite interesting. Um, because they are very nest specific. Um, the appearance in age will appear from the very first decades of life into 40, 50 years old adult patients. Um, and the clinical manifestations will vary from intracranial hemorrhage, um, ischemic stroke, TIA, seizures, headache, or cardiac impairment. We know that children with pediatric patients predominantly will present with ischemia and adults will present with hemorrhagic episodes. However, this will vary and it could, um, adults could present with ischemic and vice versa. Patients that present, that, uh, present with ischemic type uh, easily could present you know, TIAs just by hyperventilating, crying, or having fever. And there's interesting, if you extrapolate this, you know, to the anesthesia setting, and you think about the patient having pain or temperature changes could potentially cause TIAs. And that's why the importance of having a very detailed, detailed um, planning uh, to treat these patients. The appearance of lacunar strokes are rare and they're usually associated with good prognosis. And the MMD will induce infraction in most of the arteries of the cervical of willis, anterior circulation, posterior circulation, and um, that's our artery. For the diagnosis, uh, there are many different ways um, to diagnose and, and have criteria. I'll stick uh, to the first criteria that came from the Ministry of Japan. Um, and they will divide it first in zero and geography, and they will look for three of those, either a, a stenosis in the ICA, ACA, or MCA, as well as the abnormal vascular network of, of vessels and bilateral findings. However, that could be different if we have an MRI, MR and geography, with kind of looking for the same factors, stenosis, abnormal vascular network and better findings. And once we have one of those, we'll go with the exclusion criteria to make the diagnosis of MMT.
thermal simulation studies, uh, probably BSA is the, the best way to do that. And there will be two characteristics that we should look for. First of all, is the concentric enhancement of the distal ICA and the shrinkage of the MCA. This uh, other slide, I present some of the image, how uh, you can expect to see that in the MRI, in the MR geography. In this first image, letter A, you can see how there is stenosis in the bilateral, bilateral ICA, and there's that network of fragile vessels at the background, which is where it comes um, and, and assembles that proof of smoke from the moya moya. Letter B, um, you can see those flow void tunnels in the red arrows, which also come from that network of vessels. Interestingly, that network vessel would gradually fade away. And you can see in patients with <clears throat> later stages of moya moya, this is how that uh, network vessels uh, fade away and, and it mainly will rely on the external uh, circulation. So let me dig a little bit more into that. This is the Suzuki classification. Let me do that a little bit bigger um, so we can actually see. So uh, here in letter A, we'll begin and say, and, and say that this is probably the early stages of MMD. We'll have this vessel of the ICA and you can see how there is a narrowing and probably much of the vessels are unchanged. We'll chart the gray as the external carotid artery. However, as the disease will progress, that network of fragile vessels will begin to grow and we'll see definitely more strictures or stenosis around other vessels. Very interestingly, vessels will begin to change, will begin to elongate and increase in diameter. As long as, as we progress in the disease, um, vessels will change, that network vessel of, of fragile vessels will begin to grow a little bit more. However, they're usually not the function as collateral flow and all the distal vessel will begin to shrink. And as the disease progresses, that network of vessel will fade away and will have at the end only the vessel that come from the external carotid artery. So those are the Suzuki classification with the more and more disease, how it goes through time and how it progresses. EEG, EEG could also help us to do a diagnosis of MMD. And this is actually pathognomonic sign in pediatric patients. Um, and that comes after the hyperventilation test. So we know that a patient that with a diagnosis of MMD, we shouldn't put him to hyperventilate, but patient that we don't know that has MMD it's, and it goes through an EEG, uh, will have that hyperventilation test. And once they start to hyperventilate, uh, 102 minutes after, they will reveal that delta weight rhythm, as you can see here on the left and the right, which is pretty much generalized. And that is a pentagonomic sign of an endothelial patient, and it's called a delta rebuild. In terms of treatment, uh, I guess the first thing to ask ourselves is why should we treat MMD? And the response to that is that without any intervention, uh, the risk of having a stroke will be around 20% in the first year, and that will increase to five in the subsequent years. However, patients that are symptomatic bilateral will have probably even 80% chance of recurrence. So that makes a lot of sense to treat these patients. Unfortunately, there is no specific treatment to prevent MMD, but we can definitely treat symptoms with aspirin and antiepileptic drugs. When we talk about surgery, the main goal will be to improve the blood flow and promote neoangiogenesis. So it will have um, 
two heads go to promote neon genesis and in, in improve blood flow. Sorry. So let's dig into the surgery. So revascular season surgery, it's believed to be useful to activate skin insults, and there are several surgical techniques available, and we'll classify them as direct and direct. Um, the direct revascular season type mainly will be an infected intracranial artery, which will be anastomosed to an infected intracranial artery. So for example, the STA, the superficial temporal artery, will be anastomosed to MCA, which is effect. And the indirect revascular session um, mainly will be to take advantage of the vascular growth factors of the ischemic brain and induce you know, on top of them with uh, unaffected tissue and promote neoangiogenesis. So for direct techniques, we have the STMCA, um, the superficial temporal artery to MCA, STA, ACA, OA, PCA, anastomosis. And for the indirect techniques, we'll have the EDAS, which mainly, as you can see in the name, during artery, it will be to move the STA, for example, superficial temporal artery, and attach it to dura. Uh, the EMS will be <laughs> to grab the temporal muscle and put it on the top, attach it on the top uh, of the surface of the brain. The pile synagosis will be to put in close, in close proximity pile with the dura and to increase the, the superficial area of the PIA uh, to have great contact. And the EDMS will be a mixture of you know, putting that muscle and in also the unaffected artery uh, with the dura. There could be also mental transportation patients. This patient probably will have a laparotomy and a craniotomy. And also there's some literature about rear holes which could promote neoangiogenesis. So how does it look a typical planning of a patient with MMD? Well, firstly, we'll begin <clears throat> by having imaging uh, from the brain, the sculpture by MRI, uh, doing those perfusion studies with acetylsalamide and to have an idea of the cerebrovascular reserve um, the six vessel angiography, and that's for to see if there is any acute infarct. And if there is, the surgery will be held and wait for six weeks. Otherwise, the patient will get into surgery. And with, uh, with all that information for previous imaging, we made the decision to do either direct or indirect. However, having most centers will use intra op Doppler. Uh, to have final decision. Patients with poor reserve or having MCA or ACA occlusion will have combined techniques, meaning they'll have direct uh, revascularization and indirect revascularization. They'll have a mix of both techniques. And patients with good collateral flow probably will have just indirect revascularization. And lastly, patient having bilateral infection uh, most centers will do it one first and one wait one week and then the other. Uh, and other centers will do it once in a time to prevent any other anesthetic risk and costs. So what happens with outcomes? So uh, outcomes are difficult to characterize because we don't have that much of the patients and we don't have access to randomized control trials. However, this fairly recent meta-analysis grab a, a whole bunch uh, of retrospective studies. There were two outcomes which were which had uh, statistical significance. The first one was to see the probability of future stroke. And they were able to prove to demonstrate that with direct surgery, um, the probability of future stroke is less. And also uh, the good angiographic outcome, which also was significant to direct surgery. 
what happens with aneurysm? So aneurysm will have high prevalence in patients with MMD around 20 or more percent. Um, there's no consensus how to treat them. Um, however, there are you know, different therapeutic strategies. Um, certainly we know over time that EDT, it will be, and it is the mainstay in the treatment of aneurysm in patients with MMD. However, the complexity just to classify them is overwhelming. Usually it will, it will be divided in major artery aneurysms and no major artery aneurysms. However, that division is, is quite vague. So they did a subclassification into distal coronary artery aneurysm, more and more vessel aneurysm, transdural cerebral aneurysms, and anastomosis aneurysm. So this is how they can have a better idea how to approach them in treatment with intervascular treatment. So now let's dig into the anesthetic management. As a general idea, we know that there's no evidence of, of any an anesthesia technique that is better or drug. Um, and certainly this is the problem we encounter usually. We, you know, most of the techniques uh, as soon as they're, you know, adapt to the patient needs will be beneficial. However, the goal for anesthesia is to keep the balance in oxygen supply and demand um, to keep the cerebral blood flow by avoiding mainly hypertension and keeping normal capnia. And we'll dig into that concept a little bit more. And anything that could increase the metabolism of oxygen should be prevented. Uh, in terms of the anesthetic evaluation, you know, go in and have a clear idea if the patient has had any history of TIAs or any other complications will help us to prevent and know the risk factors for periop complications. Um, patients, usually patients will have some type of neurological deficit and will be in chronic medication, you know, blood thinners and anti seizure medication. And having a good idea of symptom-free blood pressure in order to guide and drop hemodynamic goals is highly advisable. Usually the patient will have aspirin, so either you know, switch it, but stopping it is probably not the best option. Communication induction, as we said, at some point, patients could do TIA just by hyperventilating and being anxious. So given, you know, pre-medication drugs to this patient is highly advisable and maybe more than with any other uh, group of patients. Um, during induction, preventing hypoxemia, hypercapnia, coughing, and bucking should be avoided. And during induction, you know, make it smooth and avoid increasing ICP and keep the CPP. For more monitoring and maintenance, uh, ASA monitors invasive blood pressure. Most centers will use some type of serial ischemia monitoring, either EG, nurse, wood potentials of TCD. Uh, it's no evidence which is better, but something certainly is, is advisable. Uh, most of the current, uh, evidence will tend to advise use volatile agents in patients with MMD. And the reason behind that is because they will cause some type of vasodilatation. Um, as you can see in this well-known paper, uh, and as we know, right, volatile anesthetics will increase the cerebral blood flow. So, you know, patient that is having chronic uh, ischemia and stenosis, that makes a lot of sense as long as it doesn't go above on a Mac. However, as everything, right, there are controversies. And this one paper examined, you know, the regional cortical blood flow in the ICP of patients with sevoflurane and propofol. And in this first graph, letter A, you can see the X axis, the S meaning sevoflurane and the P propofol, and this lobes of the brain, frontal and temporal parietal. 
and on the y-axis you will see cerebral blood flow. And interestingly, they found that in the frontal lobe using propofol, the, cerebral, the region of cerebral blood flow is higher and increased. So propofol will keep it, but in the frontal lobe it will increase and, and this paper will advise to use propofol. And B, they show in this one patient in the X, how after switching from sevoflurane to propofol, the cerebral blood flow increased uh, in those patients. And this paper also demonstrated that the intracranial pressure in patients using propofol was lower with, significant, with a statistic significance than with sevoflurane. So, you know, I guess there will be papers about sevoflurane and propofol the decision will have it. This other paper uh, claims that TIVA is better on the reason that volatiles will cause uh, steel, right, the steel phenomenon, which is difficult to prove. However, in Moya Moya patients that have that big collateral network of fragile vessels could be um, you know, more reasonable. However, so um, we don't have hard evidence about which one is better. What we could advise is that, you know, uh, B40 cross clamping on the MCA gives something to the patient, I did probably something else to cause some type of burst suppression, but mainly to decrease the um, oxygen metabolism in the brain. At the same time, increase the miniature pressure, five to 10, Millimeters of mercury um, after MCA is clamped to promote that collateral perfusion of the brain. In terms of ventilation, uh, we know that CO2 is a potent modulator, and because of that, it will be a major factor in determining determine neurological complications. And we can think from that that having the patients, you know, uh, with hypercapnia pro could promote vasodilatation and do better for this sort of patients. However, there's two studies prove that the response and reactivity drain to CO2 is highly impaired and decreased. So because of that, probably the best thing is to keep those patients on the normal capnia. In terms of blood pressure, um, the advice is to keep them at or above the periop baseline. Um, any you know, decrease or fall in MAP could potentially uh, have catastrophic effects on the patients. Um, so any hypotensive technique should be avoided. And some authors will recommend uh, or will advocate to avoid hyperosmotic drugs in order to prevent dehydration and hypotension. Um, and they will advise that in case the ICP is elevated, it's better to do a ventricular drain than using hyperosmotic drugs. And that is debatable, but however, it has been uh, suggested. Uh, to keep the pressure uh, in a good state, you can either choose dopamine, phenylephrine, and ephedrine. Uh, in recent publications, we have discussed and seen that ephedrine probably is, is the best uh, you know, uh, drug for the brain. However, uh, I had the opportunity in the snack to discuss a couple of cases using dobutamine, which I will present at the end. And it's an option that some centers are using with good outcomes. In terms of hematocrit, uh, certainly having any decrease in hematocrit we won't, won't be beneficial for the patient. And any you know, level of anemia should be corrected and critical to, to check that during the surgery. There's no consensus which level of hematocrit is better or useful. However, we know that 30 to 40% it is, it should be around. Um, and it, it, it's a and prevent any type of polyhemia because that would increase viscosity and cause some type of infraction to the patient. 
some authors will promote MOD dilution uh, to keep that CDP. However, we know that excess in fluids could also uh, provoke severe ischemia by reducing the oxygen capacity of the brain. Temperature-wise, uh, it's also kind of controversial. Um, at the beginning, it was advised to do hypothermia, right, to promote that neuroprotection. However, later on, some authors postulated that you know, dropping blood pressure could promote or provoke fastest passing. And we know that hyperthermia will increase the uh, oxygen consumption of the brain. So the general consensus is just to keep the patient normal thermic. However, keeping the patient normal thermic from the very beginning, we all have the experience that once we induce the patient, usually it's hypothermic and will take some time until it gets to that normal thermia. But I think that with this group of patients, we don't have that luxury. So we should implement something like this, the normal thermia, which is well known, and there are a lot of ways to do it in algorithms, and mainly in the pre-op phase to prevent that time between induction and achieving that normal thermia. How about fluids? Well, fluids uh, will be also, you know, the goal to keep hypovolemia or even hypervolemia, which some authors will advise, um, keeping a good urinary output because we know that low urinary output is associated with bad um, or complications after surgery. And some centers will aim to have more than four cc per an hour of urinary output. Some specifics. Um, so, you know, the consensus is to keep the CPP at or above the baseline. Um, and because the heart regulation will be disrupted in, in the areas that are ischemic, um, the CPP will be directly uh, proportional to the pressure. So keeping the pressure at or above baseline is a recommendation. However, at the same time, I will, will cross into this cerebral hyperperfusion, which will cause in a group of patients transient focal neurological deficits. Uh, this is certainly def difficult to measure and the rationale behind that is because of the vascular season surgery and they're you know, attaching it to a small diameter recipient artery, it will cause that serial hyperperfusion. It has been reported about 40% in adults, which is more prevalent too. However, other authors will promote or will say that the cause of those focal neurological deficit is not actually hyperperfusion, uh, but hypoperfusion, right? So there is, there is, uh, a lot to do and to investigate into this topic. For the post-op management, you know, taking care as well, the pressure, you know, all that will be advised to prevent any type of hypertension, hypertension and keeping MAP around 80 to 100 in adults. Um, as well, keeping a good uh, amount of IV fluids and starting aspirin as soon as possible. In terms of pain, I don't wanna say that it's not recommended to do scalp block, but it will depend just be aware if it is an indirect uh, technique, then you know, be sure that you're not doing that scalp block in, in a dangerous place. However, pain is certainly as you with neuroendocrine responses, it could promote infractions. So we should take good care of that. Um, on the other side, giving too much opioids could provoke hypercapnia and as they will uh, provoke problems and, and decrease in cerebral blood flow. Um, there are authors who, who will you know, um, advise to avoid any type of intramuscular uh, injections in pediatrics, even to you know, be very detailed and, and, and prevent any type of, of entire hyperventilation and even do local anesthetics uh, to place all the lines. Other post-operative complications, 
there's this one study which proved three risk factors of having complications after surgery, um, decreased urinary output, decreased hematocrit, and pre-op low density areas in the CT scan. So taking care of that. And very interesting, you know, uh, having, you know, how the, the surgery technique went, you know, and, and sparing vital cardiac vessels, the name of retraction will also certainly impact um, the outcome and avoid pre-op complications. So I have this um, case, which I mentioned uh, early on, and it was one case that I had the opportunity uh, to discuss in this NAC meeting, this past 221. And basically their, uh, their approach is to use uh, albumin um, and kind of have the patient um, in, a, in a good volume status and therefore uh, use the butamine taking advantage of the beta-2 receptor that caused vasculitis adhesion and use as well as some vasopressin. So that is just another way of treating this uh, uh, Houston-based um, center, which had a, a good uh, series of patients, uh, which had had a good outcome using this combination of, of agents. And we can discuss a little bit more of that. Um, and this is another case in which they presented and did pretty much the same thing, um, going with some degree um, in it. So uh, other questions for discussion, uh, as I said before, is that transient neurological deficit caused by hyper or hypoperfusion. Uh, in most of the papers coming now is to try to answer this question, if that's the cause um, after revascular disease surgery. And lastly, we have here the protocol that we use currently. Uh, so we can also discuss if there, you know, if everything is updated, if we should, you know, add or change uh, things in our current protocol on where more intra intracranial bypasses. That's pretty much what I have. Thank you for listening.